Okay, I'm gonna start broadcasting now. Okay. Welcome to the webinar today, folks. I can see we've got a number of folks that are starting to join us. Um, if you would, um, if you have a question throughout the presentation, go ahead and utilize the Q&A function rather than the chat box. We do have the chat disabled for this webinar. Uh, we'll get started in just a, a minute or two um, after we get everybody in. All right, thank you. Again, welcome um, to the webinar today, folks. Um, if you're just logging in, we have disabled the chat box, so please go ahead and utilize the Q&A function. Uh, we'll be getting started in just a couple minutes. And just so that you know, this is being recorded, um, so we will uh, be providing this link um, on our YouTube channel, and um, feel free to check it out there if you want to review any of the materials or share it with your friends. All right, my clock says 10.02, so I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. Um, we may still have a few folks kind of uh, logging in here over the next few minutes, but I just wanted to take this opportunity to um, introduce myself and our program, and then we'll get started on the Herbs for Central Florida webinar. My name is Alyssa Vinson, and I'm the Residential Horticulture Agent for the Manatee County Extension Office, and I have the pleasure of working with our 109 Master Gardener volunteers, of which your speaker today is one, and we also have some panelists that are joining that are also Master Gardener volunteers. And we're part of the Florida Extension Service, which if you're not familiar with the Extension Service, we are a function of the University of Florida. And we take the information that is gleaned from research that's done at all kinds of educational institutions, and we distill that information down and make it relevant and applicable for the people in our communities with the end goal being to enhance the quality of life for folks in our community. And so <clears throat> that's what we're doing here today. The information you'll hear is gonna be based on um, you know, researched information and we're happy to answer your questions. Again, if you have a question, please write it in the Q&A rather than the chat box. And if you have any questions after the presentation, feel free to reach out and send myself or um, anybody at our office an email with questions regarding herbs or other landscape issues. And again, we are recording, so we will put this video up on YouTube. So feel free to check it out afterwards and share with your friends. And with that, I I want to go ahead and hand it over to um, Becky and she will get you started on your herbs for Central Florida presentation today. Thank you all. Good morning everybody. Uh, my name is Rebecca Moreland. I go by Becky. It's wonderful um, to be with everyone although it's sad not to be able to see you. I usually enjoy teaching this course when I can see you and bring all the herbs out of my garden so you can see them and smell them and really get a chance to get excited by them. Um, as Alyssa said, um, I am one of the uh, Master Gardener volunteers at Manatee County. Um, my work previously has been in public and um, preventive medicine. Um, so again, these are crazy times and trying times, but uh, we have to adapt and that's certainly what we're doing. 
As Alyssa shared with you, we are part of Manatee County um, Extension Service. Um, our local office is located in Palmetto, um, and we, I've uh, listed the telephone number there because we do encourage you to call with any questions. Uh, our email for the Master Gardeners is down there as well. So any questions that you may have that we don't get a chance to answer, um, you, you'll be able to reach us um, after that. So as I said today, um, the topic is Herbs for Central Florida, which is where we are. Um, and my main seminar objective is to create an excitement and an enthusiasm for herb garden in Central Florida. Um, uh, it's important, um, they're easy to grow, they're wonderful to grow. I also hope to talk about several cultural considerations. I mean, how can we make your growing of herbs successful? Uh, we'll talk about several specific herbs that grow well in Florida a couple that don't grow so well. Uh, and then I would like very much to share resources and references that may assist you um, in your endeavors. So that's um, this morning's um, topic uh, that we hope to use as well. Before we get started, it's always interesting to think about what is an herb? What is an herb? Is it an herbaceous plant is sometimes defined as a plant that forms a, a soft, tender stem rather than a woody stem. But many of us think that that's too inclusive because this definition leaves out many useful herbs that do have woody stems, such as rosemary. Maybe an herb is a useful plant. Um, maybe an herb are plants that are grown for medicinal and culinary um, properties. So as you can see, the, the definition of an herb is, is pretty, um, pretty loose, but the Herb Society of America goes on to say that herbs are plants valued for their fla flavor for their fragrance, medicinal and healthful qualities, economic and industrial uses, pesticidal properties, and coloring uh, materials. If you go to the dic dictionary, which is where we usually go for definitions, it refers to an herb as a flowering plant whose stem above ground does not become woody or such a plant when valued for its medicinal values, flavor, scent, or the like. So that leads us to uh, what do you think an herb is? Um, it may be anything you've planted that tastes or smells good or bad. It may be cures what ails you, can be used in some beneficial way. Um, so if we, instead of looking at a direct definition, um, let's talk about the types of herbs. There are certain culinary herbs uh, that really flavor your foods, medicinal herbs uh, that Dr. Uh, Angela Fritz, my colleague, is going to talk to you about on the 19th. There are decorative uses, and there are herbs for many other uh, purposes. So again, you can see here the uses of the herbs. Uh, many of them do have medicinal qualities, preventive product qualities. They provide certain types of vitamins and minerals. Their internal and external uses, such as tinctures, poultices, balms, essential oils as an aromatherapy, veterinary applications. Uh, we know about the culinary um, uses, the flavoring spices, pot herbs, garnishes, beverages. Uh, most of you might be making teas with lemon balm or with uh, mint, and certainly those alcoholic beverages. We know the old mojitos and we, our favorites with mints. Dye plants, um, coloring agents, mordants, inks, organic pesticides, beneficial insect attractants, complementary plantings that we'll talk about a little bit later, household uses such as cleaners, fragrances, candles, cosmetics, skin care, potpourri, and certainly the industrial applications. Uh, which gives us oils, fixatives, uh, and sometimes poisons. So kind of a broad use of herbs and what we consider herbs uh, to certainly be. Um, I want to take a few minutes and poll the audience. I want you to think about are you growing herbs now or in the past in Florida? And if so, do you feel successful? So Kathy Oliver um, has put up a polling question. If you will just use your um, mouse and click on what your answer might be. We're going to give it a few minutes uh, to see if we can get your responses in. So just click the little, um, the little circle, the answer that's best for you. How's it looking, Kathy? It's looking good. We're almost there with uh, all the responses. Super. How about one more minute? Do you have the results? 
Oh, there we go. So many of you are growing um, herbs, as you can see there, you see the, um, the percentages. Um, and then people are mainly moderately successful. Um, so again, I hope to begin to change that and get everybody, everybody get the not at alls out of there um, and then make sure that uh, we're in pretty good shape to, to grow herbs. Uh, some of you are growing a few pots, some of you are growing them in the landscape, um, certainly as well. But I'm a firm believer that herbs are a great choice to try to grow, even if you're new to Florida, new to our climate, um, new to our cultural conditions down here, but know that herbs are mainly or mostly low maintenance plants. They're pretty easy. They usually require little care after you plant them. Uh, many of them are drought tolerant, so it's not so hard to um, take care of them. They grow in most soils. Uh, some have to be a better draining soil. Some have to be a little bit more of a nutritious soil. They don't require much fertilizer, usually just a little bit of fertilizer when you first plant them. They're rarely bothered by plant pests and many times they encourage uh, beneficial pests into our garden, so they're very eco-friendly. So again, it's a wonderful choice to really begin to explore uh, growing herbs uh, in your landscape. Uh, the important facts to know about herbs so that you may be more successful uh, are some of the cultural conditions, as we like to call them in Master Gardener world. Um, we'll talk about the growth cycle. Is it an annual, um, a biannual, a perennial? propagation techniques, how can we get more out of our herbs, spacing, the part of the herb that we use, do we use the leaf, do we use the root, do we use the stem? Uh, as my colleague Dr. Fritz says, you basically use it all, but uh, she'll talk about that as well. Harvesting techniques and what the uses are for these particular um, herbs. Um, I want to give you uh, an extension resource very quickly. Uh, James M. Stevens has been um, a, a very active person within University of Florida and the IFAS um, group there. Um, he has written Herbs in the Florida Garden that I included for you, um, a picture of that particular um, IFAS fact sheet that we have. It is now outdated and it's being revised, um, but the revision hasn't been finished yet. And we'll talk about that just shortly, as well as Vegetable Garden in Florida um, it's a wonderful book if you'd like to vegetable garden, but chapter 17 talks about herbs in the Florida garden, page 98 to 111, lists many of the herbs and gives us an awful lot of information as well. The main thing in both of these documents and references are the, is the um, table one, which are herbs in the Florida garden. And here you'll see a list of herbs by um, alphabetical uh, listing, a growth cycle, whether it is an annual, propagation, spacing, how far apart we can use those, what part we use, and uh, when we harvest. Um, so it's a wonderful kind of summary all in one page uh, that I go to all the time because it helps me to make sure that I'm uh, using my herbs correctly. So the grow cycle, cycle of herbs, many of my friends and colleagues who say I've tried to grow herbs and they just die. Well, the first thing I want you to know is to find out what the grow cycle of the herb you're trying to grow may be. If it's an annual one, annuals, similar to the definition, are basically only meant to grow for one year. So they grow for one year and then they die. The difficulty here is in Florida is that we never have weather that's cold enough to naturally die them off. Uh, they just die. So people think it's their reason that their herbs are dying. But the annuals are supposed to re be replenished every year. They're only meant to really be wonderful uh, and, and fabulous for that one year. A biennial means that they're good for two years. Um, so again, depending on how you take care of them, depending on what happens, we can expect them to flourish uh, for about two years. And then the herbaceous perennials are basically there. They're going to continue to be there. And if, with, if you were planting a herbaceous perennial and it dies, then you may want to take a look at the cultural condition that you've, um, that you've uh, introduced to it or how your practice is to see if you're the culprit or it might have died. But it's really wonderful to know at the outset, the herb that you pick, um, what is the growth cycle of that herb? Uh, and then woody perennials um, basically have a woody stalk. And as we talked about in the definition of herbs, the woody stalks um, are a, a potential for herbs um, as well. So a couple of annual basil lands in that annual category too. Um, I've had a lot of trouble with basil until this year. And this year my basil is flourishing. Um, some of the basils have woody stems and they're considered below, but anise, basil, borage, uh, calendula, cayenne pepper, serval, coriander, um, or what we consider to be uh, cilantro, 
dill and nasturtium all annual. They're basically only meant to, to exist for about a year. The biannuals though, burdock, caraway, curly or English parsley, they should be able to thrive for two years, uh, especially the, the parsley that we see. So it's nice to know that every two years you're gonna need to, um, to replace that or replenish that um, as well. So you might plant some one year and then next year plant another one so that you've always got herbs that are gonna be in your garden. Herbaceous perennials may include aloe, chives, um, comfy, comfrey, fennel, garlic, lemon balm, lavage, marjoram, mint, oregano, sage, sweet, woodruff, tarragon, thyme, and yarrow. So all perennials that should indeed last um, over the years as long as you take really good care of them. And the woody perennials, if you will, bay, coffee, uh, eucalyptus, fennel, geraniums, lemon verbena, lemon balm, rosemary, passion flower, um, African blue basil and roses uh, should continue to, to last in your garden for a while. I included a woody um, a rosemary that's in my garden. Uh, my husband gets angry because it grows so well, it grows into his palm tree. Uh, but once you can find a good place where the herbs are happy and thriving, uh, they will continue, um, to con continue to grow. So the woody perennials usually have some type of a woody stem uh, that we use as well. What about light? Um, how much sun is required? Most herbs do enjoy full sun or at least some piece of full sun, um, but others are quite shade tolerant. And we'll talk about this when we get to each one of the particular herbs. Um, I find that I grow most of my herbs in pots uh, so that I can move certain herbs to the shade when we get to be a hot summer like we have right now. Um, you'll find that your herbs get sunburned. Um, and again, less sun is what's needed in these hottest months. So if you grow them in a pot, you can kind of move them around your garden, especially if it's a new herb to your landscape, move them around your garden till you find the perfect place that they get the right amount of water and the right amount of light. Uh, shade tolerant herbs though, uh, prefer not to have quite so much light. Uh, they include uh, catnip, chamomile, serval, comfrey, coriander, or um, cilantro, ginger, lemon balm, lovage, mint, uh, parsley, periwinkle, tarragon, and thyme. Uh, we also include in there, um, a couple of other ones, uh, but certainly no right now we're going ginger at the community garden and we don't have any shade. So we've kind of created shade with um, palm fronds that kind of shade these particular things too. So shade tolerant herbs will get, their leaves will get a little bit damaged uh, if they get too much sun or get that sunburn. Um, pruning and maintenance, John Dawson, who's joining us as a panelist, he's going to talk to you next week on the 12th. Uh, he'll talk a lot about the pruning and maintenance um, but just for purposes of the cultural condition, know that most herbs do need a haircut, especially if you're growing them well and they're really thriving. Uh, the woody herbs, especially the basil, do need to be cut back. Uh, we usually cut back the main stem and pinch the branch tips to make it bushier. Just know that anywhere that you cut them, that begins to be the growth point. So you can actually sculpt your herbs to form the shape that you want um, or to indeed, the more you cut, the more you get. Um, so harvest your herbs often. Um, I just find I go out to the garden when I need the basil or I need my thyme, pick it, and you've got fresh herbs that are just wonderful. Um, but make sure if you're planting the herbs in the landscape, like John Dawson is going to talk to you next week, uh, many spread like small shrubs in the ground. So you just want to make sure that you pay attention to how closely or what the spacing is for each one of those herbs. Um, I want to mention just for a few minutes companion plant planting. Uh, some people think that it's, um, that it's not that important, but I found that it is nice to begin to, uh, to pay attention to that. Uh, it's helpful if you think of building good plant communities, uh, plants that tend to, to help each other. Um, when you plan your garden, uh, time-tested garden wisdom holds that certain plants uh, grown close together become helpmates, if you will. Um, we're still working on the research that supports this, uh, but science does confirm that some plants bully each other they don't like each other and therefore they don't help each other to thrive. Uh, certain plants grow rapidly and they crowd others and take more than their fair share of the water, the sun, and the nutrients. And some plants actually exude toxins that, retor that retard plant growth or kill the plant. Uh, so it's nice to know that too. So if you take a look at a couple of the examples, I've got the good companions on the left of your screen, the bad companions on the right. Basil, if you will, has a number of good companions. Basil and pepper and tomato and marigold, they help each other to thrive. Parsley likes uh, tomato as a buddy. But fennel, interestingly enough, as wonderful it is, most plants don't like fennel. 
So if you're thinking about planting fennel in your yard, you may want to put it somewhere that it's not around other plants, uh, so it'll do pretty well. Sage, on the other hand, um, it really likes rosemary, cabbage, and carrots, uh, and, but it's not a good companion for cucumbers. Dill likes cabbage, but it doesn't like carrots. Uh, so you begin to see uh, the difference as far as um, thinking about where you're going to plant things and where you're going to place them. Uh, this information is a fact sheet that we ha now have at the um, Extension Office, uh, but we, um, the data is courtesy of the Texas Ag Agricultural Extension Service. Um, to finish up, the scent of flowers and herbs as well as the change up in color is thought to confuse pests. <coughs> Excuse me. So sometimes um, it's nice to include these strong scents and color in your garden because they attract good pests and they also can attract good insects uh, and they confuse the pests that you don't want there. Interestingly enough, in a um, seminar I went to or I participated in in um, Sarasota last week, they talked about the fact that strongly scented marigolds, if you plant those now in your garden, they actually repel the nematodes because the nematodes can't stand the strong smell of marigolds. Uh, certain flowers and herbs attract these beneficial insects into your garden, the bees, uh, the butterflies, um, wonderful um, types of pollinators. Uh, many long-time gardeners swear that growing certain plants together improves the flavor um, as well. So garden wisdom and experience supports these traditional beneficial plant companions and I advise you keep a journal of your experience. I mean, see how things grow and see if this really pans out um, in your garden. Lastly, there's a second part to this, the herb companion chart. It gives us the good companions of herbs as well as the pests that may be repelled. So basil, again, is a really nice one. It's a good companion of tomatoes and what goes better than tomatoes and basil. And it repels flies and mosquitoes. Mint likes cabbage and tomatoes and it repels the cabbage moth, aphids, and beetles. Nasturtium likes radishes, cabbage, curbits of all types, fruit trees, uh, and it repels aphids, squash bugs, pumpkin, and beetles. And rosemary likes cabbage and beans, carrots, and sage, and it repels cabbage moth, bean bug, and carrot fly. So hopefully there is some knowledge that we have there, whether it be tradition, uh, we're constantly gathering in research that tells us a lot about this too. So this is what the two, um, the two pieces look like. Um, I think Kathy Oliver will send you the list of resources that we have and references, as well as PDFs of this information too, um, after, the, after the seminar. So let's look at some of the Florida herbs. Uh, I quickly want to do a quick poll though. Kathy? There we go. So if you'll just mark with your mouse, uh, which is your favorite herb on the list? Hopefully have one. What's your favorite herb on the list? There are lots of nice ones, basil, cilantro, dill, mint, oregano, parsley, rosemary, thyme. We're going to talk about a number of these, um, but tell us what's your favorite. We'll give it about one more minute because <clears throat> I'd like to talk about a number of these herbs. How are we doing, Kathy? We are looking good. I'm just going to wait about 15 more seconds and then show you the results. <laughs> Super. Are we going to guess? Wonder what everyone's favorite herb is. Ah. So pretty much as I, as I guess, basil is one of the very, very favorites. Cilantro comes in second, um, which I'm not surprised about. Rosemary down there is a pretty popular one, um, certainly as well. So you can see, <clears throat> needless to say, I, I anticipated talking uh, a little bit about basil um, as well. So um, again, that gives you a feel for who's growing what and who seems to like what. Um, so again, these are a number of the Florida herbs. When I very first planted an herb garden, as a master gardener trainee, we planted this at the extension service, and you can see all the different herbs that we managed to get um, growing pretty well um, as well. So basil, the number one hit on what's everybody's favorite herb. There are multiple types though. There's sweet basil that you see at the top. Uh, there's African blue basil that you see with the blue spike down there at the bottom right-hand corner. Lemon basil, opal basil, all different types of basil. 
Uh, the African blue basil down towards the bottom is more a woody type of a plant. Uh, it's, it's not so much used for cooking, but just know it's a wonderful, wonderful pollinator plant. Uh, so most of the basils are annuals. They're only going to be good for one year. Then you're going to have to at least plant more seed or plant new plants. Um, but again, it grows from seed planted about a quarter of an inch deep in early spring or fall. Uh, basil doesn't <clears throat> necessarily like the hot weather that we have now, um, but as you can see, it's used really um, strongly in salads, soups, uh, and most anything Italian. Uh, to the right there is my mom's favorite recipe for shrimp soup uh, that's heavily um, uh, uh, got basil that's one of the fragrances, it's one of the herbs that we have. Um, but know that um, University of Florida has done an awful lot of research uh, so that there are plant diseases uh, that um, are frequent with some of the basil as well. So just know that there are a number of problem and symptoms that can show up, but our cultural controls can kind of help us to control this. Downy mildew appeal, appears as yellowing of the leaves, it's con concentrated in the middle vein of the basil leaf. Uh, so try to use disease-free seed um, that as the pathogen is known to be transmitted in the seed and then reduce leaf wetting. If you're gonna water the plant, water just the soil and try to avoid uh, getting the leaf. So avoid overhead watering. Leaf spot are those dark spots on the leaves and dead areas within these spots causing a shot hole type of an appearance. Uh, but know that the, the, these particular holes, the spores are water splashed from diseased tissue. So certainly remove the leaves that have this leaf spot, but don't throw them on the ground, throw them away. Because um, if you throw them on the ground, then as you water, these spores are gonna be washed, uh, water splashed back up. Sow seeds in sterile containers, reduce leaf wetness, increase plant spacing to increase the airflow so that we can, again, decrease the, the wetness that we see on the leaf. Bacterial leaf spot, uh, water soaked and dark spots on the leaves, uh, wet stem rot may occur, and the bacteria may be um, seed borne. So it's back to the same cultural control. We want to be sure that we water appropriately. We've got good plant spacing to increase the airflow and definitely remove these diseased leaves uh, and the plants and use uh, clean sterile tools. If we do that, then we don't transmit the disease from one basal plant to the other. And fusarium wilt is one that we just can't stand, that we really dislike, yellowing, distortions. Uh, this disease is seed borne and it lasts in the soil for many years. So if you see anything um, with the fusarium wilt, if you're not sure, you can bring a leaf into the plant clinic and they can help you diagnose it. Uh, but we still are really recommending disease-free seeds, sterilized soil, rotating fields or containers, removing and destroying any diseased plants or leaves, and using clean sterile tools. Uh, so again, all helping us to be sure that those of you whose favorite is basil, that you have wonderful basil that you can use uh, and it grows really well. Chamomile is an annual one, um, but routinely it's a self-seeder uh, so that the little flowers that you see there to the bottom, uh, once they die, they um, develop a seed, the seed gets thrown on the ground, and then supposedly uh, that is what comes back up the next year. So it's not really a perennial or a biannual, but it is an annual self-seeder. It prefers shade and it really likes dry soil. There's a German and a Roman variety. Um, many of you know this because it's good in herbal tea that um, Dr. Fritz is gonna talk about on the 19th. It's equally good in a sweet wine sauce, aids in digestion, stomach ailments, and, and inflammation. I included it here though to let you know that because many of us know about chamomile as an herb, I have not had any success in growing it in Florida. Plus, it seems to attract not only white fly, but aphids and fungus. So if you're new to growing herbs, don't choose this one. Um, as you get uh, more familiar and more successful, give it a try because it's a wonderful herb, um, but it is a little bit tough to grow in our Florida rep and our Florida weather. Uh, cilantro, I know many of you guys love this one. Uh, cilantro is also known as Chinese parsley, uh, but also known it's a, it's a form of coriander uh, grown for its leaves. Uh, it is an annual plant. It does like full sun to part shade. Uh, the more sun, the better, uh, but not necessarily our hot weather. Um, it likes rich, well-drained soil. And so as you can see there, the flat, uh, the flat feathery leaves are often used in Latin American and Southeastern, Southeast Asian cuisines. Uh, but if you're gonna grow this, because of our hot weather that we have down here, uh, the uh, cilantro tends to go to seed and bolt pretty quickly. So you probably need to, to grow one seed every week and be sure that you've got plants that are coming up 
So as the one, as the one plant goes to seed, uh, then you've got another plant that's coming up that'll have these nice green leaves that you can use uh, in your cooking. Uh, once it goes to seed, know that the seed, as you see there at the bottom of the picture, is referred to as coriander. And coriander is a wonderful seed that can be used itself uh, in many Indian restaurants and Middle Eastern restaurants. They actually will show you a bowl of coriander and you basically eat the coriander seed because it gets rid of garlic on your breath um, after you finish the meal. So that's a nice one to know too. But cilantro is coriander, especially once it gets to be uh, the seeds. Culantro, one of John Davison's favorites, is our Florida uh, cilantro. It does like hot weather but it's best grown in the shade. It is a biannual, it should last for two years. Uh, we harvest the long leaves that you actually see there, uh, but if the plant bolts, and bolts means it starts to develop seeds, you see in my picture, this we had over at the community garden, uh, as it grows, it, it forms a little spiky type of a flower. Once that happens, it's not as desirable for um, use in cooking, but it does have a little bit of a stronger cilantro flavor. Uh, commonly grown in the Caribbean, Central America. Uh, it's the same family as cilantro, but very different in appearance, as you can see here, but also very, very healthy because it contains vitamins such as C, B1, B2, A, calcium, and iron. So a wonderful uh, nutritional herb, as well as very flavorful. Cuban oregano, for those of you who have not started to grow anything, uh, Cuban oregano um, is wonderful. There's not much that can harm it. Uh, it's an herb of ambiguous origin, and it's got many names. I've always called it Cuban oregano, but it can be Spanish thyme, Mexican mint, Indian borage. So again, a lot of different um, types. It is a perennial evergreen. <clears throat> it's also um, woody. Um, I am showing you one of the, um, the stems that I pulled out of my garden, and you can actually see the woody stem that's actually there. It has this spreading growth habit that we see, um, but I wanted to zoom in on the leaves and you can see the very aromatic velvety leaves um, that we have as well. Does like partial shade, well-drained soil. It is frost tender. So in the winter time when it grows pretty well, uh, you may need to keep it in pot so you can pull it into the garage if we're gonna get a frost. It's got a very, very strong fragrance. Um, so again, if you tend to put it in vases, it's beautiful. Um, but again, it's, it has a strong fragrance and it should be used sparingly as it overpowers easily if you put it in any of your uh, cooking dishes. Okay, fennel. <clears throat> Another wonderful one that we have, uh, often referred to as a Florence fennel. Um, it's known by several different names, sweet fennel, sweet anise, um, feticus. It is an annual and it's planted for the bulb thickened like base that you see of the leaf stem. Uh, in the top picture, you can kind of see the bulb that's there. So there are many parts of the fennel plant that we use. Uh, the bulb is below ground. Uh, it can be uh, cleaned and chopped up and used in cooking, as can the feathery leaves, uh, as can the seeds that grow um, as it begins to, um, uh, to develop. It prefers cooler weather, although uh, my fennel is doing pretty good out in my garden right now. It is away from other plants, so uh, it's doing pretty well. Uh, does like direct sun and lots and lots of water. It's got that licorice or anise flavor and fragrance uh, that's pretty, but know that it's often the host plant for caterpillars of black swallowtails. Uh, so I went out to the garden one day and actually looked, and here indeed are the little caterpillars that you see. Indeed, the monarch butterflies found it uh, and were on the, um, the fiddle as well. I do find it such a pretty plant and I love to plant vases inside my home I had a number of these feathery things inside my house and all of a sudden looked down one day and lo and behold, uh, the little caterpillars showed up. So out they went to make sure that they could live and form more butterflies. So, but just know you may have to share your fennel um, with them. Lavender, another wonderful one. We mainly know it for its fragrance. I don't find I use it that much in, um, in cooking because it kind of, to me, has a soapy-like taste, uh, but it's got a wonderful um, fragrance. It's um, mainly known for that fragrance and it's believed to be an important relaxing calmative herb. Uh, so if you put it in a little cloth um, satchel, uh, keep it by your bed, chances are it'll really help promote, uh, promote sleep. It is a perennial, it should continue to live um, year after year after year, but if you're new to gardening, do not choose lavender. I sometimes find it hard to grow. In fact, I was excited because I finally had lavender growing this year and now it's dead. So that's because of me, 
Um, you do find that it prefers very, very, very dry soil and direct sun. And uh, Kathy Oliver has suggested to me that it also needs to be very pot bound. So it's important to grow it in a pot so you can move it, but also because it likes to be in that pot bound. Um, it's often dried to preserve the scent and it's used uh, to help sleeplessness. So it's a wonderful herb, but best to kind of buy sprigs. Uh, and again, just don't think that you've done something wrong because it is a very difficult one to grow here in Florida. Lemongrass, another wonderful one. Uh, it's an herbaceous perennial. Uh, it grows like crazy. It's originally from India. It's grown for its lemony fragrance, uh, like full or part sun. Uh, but use care, as you can see at the bottom, uh, this will grow to be three to five feet tall. Uh, if you look, I planted some uh, lemongrass in our herb fountain that we have at the Educational Gardens uh, over here in Palmetto. I thought I needed something tall to accentuate the tall part of the, of the fountain that we planted. Uh, and lo and behold, it gets a foot tall, it gets two feet tall, but it can grow very, very tall. So just make sure wherever you put it, you keep an eye on it. And when it gets too big, you find a, a nice place that it can really expand. As you may recall, we use it a lot in Thai style soups and curries. Uh, we harvest the bottom stalks and peel off the outer layer, layers and then use the inside uh, to flavor, you know, lemony types of things as well. So lemongrass is a nice one uh, to really think about uh, in your Florida garden. Mexican tarragon, one of my favorites. Uh, Mexican tarragon, as you can see, nice spiky leaves. Uh, the more we tend to, to brush the leaves and uh, get the oils going, the more we can smell it and, uh, and, and uh, appreciate its fragrance. It is a perennial. Um, I find that with the, with the um, tarragon, it really does grow well. I've taken the leaves off the bottom and everywhere the leaves come off creates a node. If you just pop that in the soil, where these nodes are, those are gonna create um, roots. So it's pretty easy to propagate. John Dawson will talk about that uh, next week as well. Great choice for Florida gardeners. Uh, it's tolerance to drought, to heat and humidity, as you can imagine, make it wonderful choice uh, for growing here in Central Florida. French tarragon is the one we know a lot about. It's pretty difficult to grow here in our warm, moist climate, um, but this is the Mexican tarragon and it does do quite well. It's got that semi-woody uh, herb, forms a small upright bush, and then it does have beautiful little yellow flowers that you see in the picture there. The little flowers are almost like uh, marigold flowers, teeny little marigold flowers. Uh, both the leaves and the flowers are very, very edible, so it's fun to pick them, throw them into a salad, um, put them as you cook vegetables. Um, but watch sensitivity. Um, because of the family from which it comes, the asterisks, uh, some people are a little bit sensitive to it. So again, use that journal and, and see. Um, but it's got a complex taste that almost tastes like licorice. Um, I find it's really nice on chicken uh, with a couple of different types of vegetables. So a really, really wonderful um, choice. Mint. Uh, what's, what's not to like about mint? It is a perennial. It's very easy to grow. Another great choice for those of you who haven't been growing anything. It's also beneficial because it attracts pollinators. Uh, it does do well in Florida's hot, humid client, climate. Um, you see the little leaves up there. Uh, there are 19 or so different varieties that are really an awful lot of fun. Peppermint, spearmint, orange mint, chocolate mint, all wonderful types of, of mints. Um, John Dawson will share with you that he thinks it's just because we, we put that thought in one's eyes uh, that we think chocolate mint really tastes like chocolate mint. I happen to think it does. Uh, but they are wonderful and fun to grow um, in, your, in your yard. Uh, we can propagate them by cuttings and divisions. A lot of these mints actually have runners, uh, so the runners can be removed and then transplanted. Um, but because they're easy to grow and they grow well, just know because of this rapid growth, you may want to use containers to grow them or else you may have herbs, uh, mint everywhere. Um, but now with the, um, with the popularity of mojitos as adult beverages, uh, it seems to be the more mint, the better. Uh, we also know that many of you love mint in your teas, a couple leaves, uh, so that works out well too. I love it in my garden because I just go out, snip it when I need it. It's nice and fresh, um, so it's a, a wonderful herb uh, to really begin to enjoy. Mint. Um, oregano, another one that's a hardy herbaceous perennial, uh, one that grows extremely well here. We often call it the pizza herb um, because of some of the Italian dishes that we, um, we put um, oregano on. Um, it's one of the most widely used culinary medicinal herbs uh, that we have. 
easily grown from seed. Uh, I prefer to propagate it from cuttings. Um, you can see it there. Uh, it does the same thing as the Mexican tarragon did. You just strip off a number of the leaves. Uh, once you pick a sprig, put that in the ground where those nodes are, that's where the roots are going to form. So it does tend to, to uh, rapidly expand uh, in your garden. It loves full sun, well-drained soil. Uh, when I were moved into my home, I've got a stone wall out back. I happened to put my oregano, a couple sprigs out there. It loved it, it thrived, and I ended up with, with uh, oregano that's probably the size of two feet. Uh, so once it's happy, it's gonna stay happy. I show you the community garden here. We've got several pots of it. Um, gardeners come up and pick it and put it in their plots, and then everybody has plenty of uh, oregano. Traditionally used to help with infections. So an interesting um, side effect of oregano, very popular herb, also used as a food preservative. And it's a must if you're gonna make spaghetti, um, any type of Italian food, especially if it's fresh, it really has a delightful uh, flavor in all these Italian foods. So oregano is a good choice. Parsley, two main types, curly leaf, plain flat leaf varieties. This one is a biennial, so it's good for two years. And you see the difference in the curly leaf and the flat leaf prefers cooler seasons. You want to space it around six inches apart, but it does grow well in containers. So if you don't have much room, by all means, uh, get a parsley, put it in a, in a container, uh, put it out on your patio, but keep the soil well watered as moist soils are required. It does hail from Sardinia and the Mediterranean, was transported to England as early as uh, 1548. Use it in salads, soups, and on potatoes. So just a wonderful herb to use. Um, but can, no, again, it's, it's got an extra benefit and that it's highly nutritious, may be considered as a natural vitamin, mineral supplement, vitamins A, C, K, several B vitamins, as well as iron, iodine, and others. Uh, what could be better? So use parsley on everything. Um, but remember, plant two parsleys because uh, plants need to share parsleys. It's also a host plant uh, to butterflies. So you see the caterpillars that have found one of my parsleys. Uh, they will chomp on it, munch on it, and eat your parsley very pretty quickly. So I usually have one for them and one for me uh, in my screen bin lanai. Rosemary on the home stretch is a perennial evergreen, very, very fragrant herb. In many situations, we like to plant rosemary right at the entrance to your home. So as people come in to visit, when they can come to visit, uh, but they do kind of brush past it and it's just got such a nice fragrance. It enhances your cooking as well as your landscape. It is drought tolerant, likes a well-drained soil. It does demand at least six hours of sunlight. It blooms in winter and spring with small pinkish flowers uh, in year two or three. Uh, so again, nice one uh, to start with uh, that you'll find pretty, uh, pretty happy as well. Thyme, small growing shrubby little perennial herb uh, that's very tasty, prefers full sun, it's drought tolerant, well-drained soils, maybe planted by seed in late fall and early spring. I usually just strip off the little leaves uh, from the stem to flavor meats or soups or eggs, scrambled eggs. Uh, and he, although it's a perennial and should continue to grow year after year, um, James Stevenson suggests that you replant it every three to four years to increase the growth. Uh, but it has been used as a strong remedy for throat and chest infections, also as a tea, uh, and it's also used as a food preservative. So a nice choice um, as well. But are these the only herbs for Central Florida? Um, absolutely not. Uh, I only introduced to you a couple of them, um, but I challenge you that grow a couple of these easy herbs. Uh, let me know what your success is, and then pick one of the ones that you haven't really heard before. Um, research it, find out what the cultural conditions are. Is it an annual? Is it a biannual? And then see um, how it grows. I know Angela Fritz, Dr. Fritz will talk to you on the 19th. Dandelion is one of her favorites. We don't have a whole lot of dandelion down here in Florida, but it will grow. Episode is uh, one of John Dawson's. Garlic uh, grows below, and um, it's a questionable whether or not it'll grow, but it's in part of our University of Florida literature. Uh, lemon balm is one of the other favorites as well. So again, so you can find uh, information about all of these. I uh, know that the University of IFA, University IFAS uh, and the EDIS, the electronic uh, data, is basically in transition right now, so that there's several places you can go to find information. Um, but again, once you click on it, it will take you to a list of herbs. You choose the herb you want, and then it will bring you information as well. 
but there's two, two places to go. One is EDIS and one is Gardening Solutions. Um, and then again, uh, the, the document that I had talked about, I think Kathy and Cindy will send you a PDF of the, of the old herbs in the Florida garden uh, that I prefaced earlier, but certainly know that Dr. Sydney Park Brown, Associate Professor Emeritus, uh, she has tackled the issue of revising this. Uh, so I, she anticipates that it should be out soon, uh, once it is, it should be a nice addition to it as well. There are numerous blogs that are available uh, that you can go on to present questions. Uh, so University of Florida IFS Extension, as well as the Master Gardener Clinic, uh, has numerous ways to help you, to get you on your way, and to encourage you to grow great, um, great herbs. So go and have fun. Herbs are easy to grow and enjoy. We've got one last poll, Kathy, if you can put that up. So how will you use the knowledge that you gained today? Um, we talked about a number of cultural um, types of things to consider um, when you're um, selecting herb to grow. Um, please be, please uh, mark all the ones that you think you may use uh, when you get ready to go out and start your herb garden or uh, complement your herb garden with some new herbs. How will you use the knowledge? Does it need sun? Does it need shade? Or I hope I hope the information was helpful, but if it's not, <laughs> so be it. How are we doing, Kathy? We are almost there. Um, uh, let me give it ten more seconds, and okay. I'll close the polling. Okay. So just mark all that apply. Oh, good. So you will try new herb varieties. Super, super. I'm glad to hear that. So again, um, as you can see there, uh, the purpose was to, to basically share an enthusiasm and excitement about herbs. Uh, so I'm glad to see that you all will do that um, certainly as well. Um, as you can see here, they're easy to grow. Some herbs grow well together. Um, this is one of the earth boxes that we have that we use that we planted a number of different types of herbs. Um, so again, in this crazy time uh, that we're all in, hopefully next time we get together to talk about herbs, it'll be in person. We can really share the fragrances, uh, the leaves, the taste, um, but stay safe and be well. Um, we've got a number of herbs in salad tables, um, and um, this is an herb garden that we have over the community garden. And this last one is one of the ones that the Master Gardener class a year or two ago actually took and recycled. Um, old bottles. So as you water the very top of this, you can imagine that as you water the top, um, it's going to um, to water all the herbs um, below that. So several different ways in which we can um, make sure that we've got that as well. But keep in touch. Let us know how your, how your herb garden grows. Visit our educational gardens when it becomes safe because we've got a number of different examples that we have. I always love to hear from you and I'm always happy to help. Um, but thanks for your attention and thanks for participating. Uh, Kathy, I think we've got a little bit of time for questions. Yes, we have a few questions in the Q&A. If anyone has questions, please uh, put them in the Q&A uh, box. Our first question is, what types of containers do you recommend as best for growing herbs on the lanai? What size, what material? <laughs> well, it depends on what size plant you grow. I think um, some of the clay pots um, breathe a little bit, uh, but you may have to water them more um, versus any of the ceramic containers or you know, the plastic containers. Um, you do have a choice. Size depends on how big you would like the herbs to get. Um, my guess is uh, give it a medium size um, shot. Um, if indeed things get too big, you can always give it a, a larger pot. Um, Kathy, I don't know if you wanna add to that. Um, no, I don't have anything to add to that. <laughs> so again, just have fun. I mean, just grow them. And again, if they're on your lanai, then you shouldn't have many of the pests. Um, but again, you'll be able to tell when they need water, you know, and, or if they need to move more into the shade or more out into the sun. Okay, our next question from Karen. Have you had any experience growing cardamom? I have not. 
Um, it's one of those that I hope to use. I don't know, John, um, can you unmute? Answer yes, that? Um, I have cardamom, but it's false cardamom. There's two types. The actual cardamom, where you get the cardamom seeds, will not grow here. The false cardamom will grow here. It doesn't produce the seeds you're looking for, but it puts out fragrant leaves that you can use in cooking as well. Is it an annual, perennial? It's a perennial. Super. It's actually a uh, ginger, so it does prefer shady location. Gotcha. Okay, thank you, John. Um, we have a comment from Glenn, Cuban oregano and society garlic are good growers. Yes. And uh, um, a question, any suggestions for growing cilantro from seed? Mine don't seem to be sprouting. I only managed to get one seedling. <laughs> it is frustrating. Um, and again, uh, again, the seeds are very, very tiny. So you want to be sure that you kind of just lay them on the soil and then kind of pack them in. Um, you, ideally, um, uh, a, a mix that's good for um, getting seeds to grow is helpful and you don't want to overwater them. And then you want to be sure that um, as the seedlings emerge, you kind of uh, baby them until they get a little bit bigger as well. John, any comments that you've got about that? Yeah, uh, it's, it's basically, we'll go over it next week, but there's different methods for trying to get difficult seeds to grow. And uh, usually the common rule of thumb is twice the diameter of the seed is the depth that you want to plant. And uh, some seeds uh, will require just laying them on the top. Um, so uh, coriander is not one of them. And you do want to make sure that your seeds are fresh, not, oh, yeah. not too old, not more than a, you know, one or two years old, uh, or the germination will decrease. Good point, Kathy. Also, if you collect your seeds from last year and you did not allow the seeds to actually dry on the plant as the plant is dying, it probably will not germinate properly. Okay, our next question from Hope is, what is lemon balm? Ooh, lemon balm is in the mint family. It kind of grows like mint, but um, it's uh, more an annual. And lemon balm, it just has a wonderful lemony taste, but it has leaves that actually look very similar to a mint. Um, but the leaves aren't quite as thick, if you will, or textured as a mint. So it's a wonderful one to grow. It does like shade. Um, and it just is a, is a really favorite of mine. Um, mine tends to come back every year and tends to attract weeds. Um, I don't take care of it quite as well, but it's a wonderful one you know, to think about too. Um, anything the panelists want to add? Yeah, it should be noted that uh, several English botanists that managed to live beyond the year 100 <laughs> attribute their old age to the um, daily drink of uh, lemon balm tea. Yeah, the wonderful tea. Just water and lemon balm and it, it does make a great tea. That's good to know. If we want to live to be 100. <laughs> Our next question, does drip irrigation work for herbs or does that over water? Mm. Well, I think it depends on if you're going to drip irrigate, you want to be sure that you, you cluster your, your plants in the appropriate way. As we talked, a number of them like well-drained soil and they like it on the drier side. Other ones like a lot of water. So if you're going to attempt to do that, you just need to be sure you cluster your herbs depending on what their water needs uh, may be um, in that sense. Um, I kind of, my yard is irrigated, but not necessarily with drip irrigation. Um, and I kind of move my plants around to cluster them so they get the appropriate water that they need. And in the summertime, the water needs are a little bit different than what they are um, in the fall and in the winter. John, any other suggestions? Yeah, you have to be very careful. Many herbs do not like to be sitting in water. So uh, if you have several days of rain and the ground saturated, it's not going to drain properly. I had parsley in the ground one time. It rained for like two or three days. 
and within a day it just totally rotted. <laughs> I hate it when that happens. I always say that they don't like their feet to be wet. But I would add that in general, it, uh, drip irrigation would be preferable to overhead irrigation. If you cannot water the soil and the roots, um, you're getting the water where it's needed rather than on the leaves where, you know, water sitting there could cause uh, fungal problems. Thank you, Kathy. And exactly. Because we talked about not overhead watering, uh, making sure that we try to keep the at least the basil leaves dry, and I think that applies to many of the other herbs we plant as well. If you use micro irrigation, there are bubblers or drippers, which are about the same as a, uh, a strip of uh, drip line. Okay, our next question from Chris: Are most herbs, specifically the Cuban oregano, dog friendly? Well, humans can eat them. You know, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. John? I, I think you would want to avoid anything in the onion family. Um, oh, I know true. those are not um, good for pets. The alums. The alums, yeah. Alums. Yeah. Uh, because they're overly fragrant and they're very strong, most dogs do not prefer to fool around trying to eat some plant that has a really strong scent. I know uh, all my herbs have been uh, protected by their scents. We had deers marauding through our neighborhood because of the construction. They ate my hibiscus and just about anything else, but they left all the herbs alone. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> what are the uses for lemongrass? mainly in Asian um, types of cooking. I think Angela, Dr. Fritz is gonna talk about that the 19th, um, but lemongrass has a lemony kind of spicy um, taste. So in a lot of um, Thai, food, Thai um, dishes, Vietnamese dishes, um, lemongrass is, is pretty nice. It's also a wonderful landscape plant uh, in the sense that it grows pretty tall and it's got nice feathery leaves uh, and it doesn't require much attention uh, to continue to thrive uh, in your garden, but it is a, it is a nice one. Okay, have you ever tried growing cinnamon here? I know it's more of a tree than an herb, but I've heard of people growing it well. Well, when we were in Vietnam, it grew well, but I, I, I don't know of anybody's experience here in Central Florida. John? Uh, yes, you can grow cinnamon trees here, but you have to remember it's a tree and it comes from the bark and it's gonna take a while. And it's, do you guys talk about that in the rare tree, rare fruit tree group that makes? Yeah, we, we get uh, some questions now and then from rare fruit, but it actually doesn't put out a fruit. So, you know, cinnamon <laughs> is from the bark itself. Bark. Exactly. In Vietnam, they actually have uh, tarps laid out and they dry it all uh, near the streets. So um, it is pretty wild to, to see them grow it and harvest it. Which herbs do I need to fertilize more often? I think the, um, the perennial herbs can use a little bit of, of fertilizer. If they're in pots, we don't have to worry about the fertilizer ordinance that we have here in Manatee County. Um, I think most of them were looking for the green of the, um, of the herb. So usually it's a balanced fertilizer. I think John's gonna talk about this more next week, um, but it's just one of those that the three numbers that you see 666, 10-10-10, uh, one of those particular fertili fertilizers, or if we're trying to encourage the, the leaves to grow, uh, it's that nitrogen component that we're looking at um, as well. But most of them do fairly well, um, but I think if you've got a perennial that's doing really well and you want to continue to have it do well, uh, just a little bit of fertilizer uh, may indeed help. But it's not like a vegetable. You don't do it on a every two month, every month basis. Uh, the, yeah, actually too much fertilizer is bad for herbs. It basically makes them try to bolt straight and go to uh, flowering and putting out seeds. So you're looking for the leaves uh, and you know, if you, if you put too much fertilizer down, they, tall, they, they grow really tall real quick 
and uh, you're, you're, you really want to have them short and stout instead of tall and leggy. Uh, Rita says, I have a curry tree in a small pot. Any thoughts on how to handle it? Did you say a curry tree? Curry tree. Yeah, curry, curry tree. leaf. John? <laughs> I'm not sure what he do. I know that. there's a curry plant. I don't believe it's actually a tree, but uh, I could be wrong. I, I'm not familiar with it. We'll have to do some research. We'll have to go to one of our reference points and see if we can find and learn more about it. I have seen them growing in pots. Um, I think they do well in the ground as also. Um, they are one of the ones that likes it drier and sunnier. Okay, let's move on. We want to plant herbs in the yard, but irrigation water is reclaimed and oh. throughout the growing areas. What are possible solutions? Well, position may be one, having your herbs in pots to allow you to move them around the garden um, may help you to find a better place, you know, where they'll, they'll do a little bit better. Uh, certainly, if you're gonna pick the herbs, you wanna be sure and wash them well. Um, you know, if once you, are you gonna use them in your cooking? Um, but that, that is kind of a tough one, but not impossible. Um, it just takes a little bit of, of um, uh, show and tell, kind of a little bit of trial and error uh, to really come up with a way in which they'll in which they'll thrive. John? Yeah, um, if you're going to use uh, irrigation uh, from re, uh, reclaimed water, uh, it's just best to wash before you actually put it in your recipes or eat yeah. fresh. Uh, other than that, uh, it's not a problem. Will solarizing the soil kill fusarium wilt? Hmm. Kathy? Solarizing does um, kill off some pathogens as well as uh, pest Nematode. insects and weed seeds. It, it does only go down maybe about four to six inches in the soil as far as, um, you know, the solarization process. So, um, you know, it's probably not a hundred percent guarantee, but it does help. But removing those plants when you first see it uh, is critical. You want to get yes. rid of anything diseased as, as soon as it comes to your attention. And certainly on a regular basis, you're going to enjoy your herbs. So you're going to be out, you're going to scout them, uh, you're going to look at them. And as soon as you discover that something looks diseased or looks abnormal, either cut it off and bring it to the plant clinic, let us take a look at it. Um, but we don't want that in the garden. And so we try to um, decrease and minimize any kinds of um, exposure that, that you may have. Do you have any tips on pruning lemongrass? I kind of prune it and use it. Um, I use the kind of outer um, leaves and I prune those first kind of closer to the ground and then it continues to grow um, upright as well. Um, and then those may be the, um, the larger or the tougher leaves, but I think there are certain ones that are a little bit uh, more tender uh, that you see as well. Lemon um, grass is just one of those that I love because you can't really hurt it. Um, and it's one that has plenty of um, opportunities to explore and to experiment with. So uh, just, just enjoy it. Yeah, and you can just uh, pull off some uh, stalks off the clump to use them or to propagate with. Yeah. Um, as long as there's some roots down there at the bottom, you can replant the bottom part after you use the top and propagate that way. Yeah, it's a great one. My woody, my rosemary plant is woody and the leaves seem to be dry. Should I cut it back to get newer leaves? I think probably so. Um, I think the more you cut, the cut point is where you're going to have a growth point. Um, it does tend to be a woody perennial that we talked about. Uh, and again, it's nice to shape it to make sure it's okay. I think if the leaves are dry, I think I would double check that it's getting water, um, that it's healthy. Um, but again, it's it certainly, you can cut back a couple of them, see if that's gonna work. Um, I just love to experiment with them and then record my journal and know what experience worked well and, and what didn't. John, I know you've got some wonderful rosemary as well. 
Yeah, it's almost impossible to kill that plant. So you can cut it back as much as you want. I like it because uh, I use the stems as skewers on the barbecue. Ah, I forgot about that. It adds a lot of flavor that way. In fact, if you want, you can also throw it in your bathtub and kind of get a little relaxing there. Angela will talk about that on the 19th. And I would say that if your rosemary is very woody and um, you're uh, just have a lot of leaves near the tips, just do some um, light tip pruning. Don't cut it back too far because if it's very woody, it might not sprout out well with some new growth. Okay, also, um, how many nitrogen fixing herbs do you know about? Well, we're exploring sesame. Now, whether or not we consider that an herb or not, you kind of go back to what the definition of an herb might be. Um, but we're growing sesame uh, to repel nematodes and to add nitrogen into the soil at our community garden. Uh, and it's interesting to see the little pods. So as they turn brown, then we end up with sesame seeds. So that's a good one. Um, some of the other nitrogen fixing ones, I'm trying to think. Uh, we're growing hemp, um, we're growing um, okra, marigolds, whether or not we consider that to be an herb, uh, it's got a nice fragrance. Um, so again, there, there are certain ones, and I think here in Florida, uh, we're looking at an awful lot of them uh, to kind of grow here in the summer since we only have limited actual vegetables that we can grow. We're growing sweet potatoes, um, okra, um, there's another one. I can't think. Sweet potatoes, okra, oh, black eyed peas. Um, but again, I don't know that we consider those to be to be herbs, but all of those help to fix the nitrogen. And then we'll till those under uh, when it gets to be September and we really start growing our other vegetables and actually put herbs in the landscape. Anybody else? Comments? No, I can't think of any really leguminous herbs. It's the legumes or the beans or peas. Right that uh, do the most nitrogen fixing. The sesame has turned out to work pretty well and, and it grows fast, um, but I'll have to let you know how we make out. Next question, I also feel like, or a comment, I feel like garlic chives deserves a mention as I've heard it grows very well here. It does, I, I will share with you that um, I like the regular chives I have a number of garlic chives and they do grow well. You can kind of split the bulb apart um, and again, replant them pretty easily. I do have them in my garden, but it's not one of my favorite, my husband's favorites. In fact, he can pick it out anytime it's in there. It has a real distinctive taste. So you may just want to experiment with it to, to be sure it's, it's something you may, you may like. But yes, it's one that grows very, very well. Uh, it is a perennial, um, so it will keep coming up as long as we take good care of it. I would like to try turmeric. How might I get seeds and how well can I expect it to grow here? Turmeric grows well, but it grows by a tuber. It grows by a root. Um, and so I, I think what's interesting is, is that even at our new market Detweilers, uh, they have those tubers that are turmeric as well. Um, we are growing it at the community garden. It does like shade. It doesn't like a whole lot of water. Um, but once the root is in the ground, I think um, Mac Lessig has it in his vegetable garden there at the extension service. Uh, it will grow large leaves, um, but it does, it's a tuber that goes in the ground. And right now I have one in a pot and it tends to be doing well, but it doesn't like a whole lot of sun. Uh, so it's got to be, it, it likes shade. So you've got to find a nice shady place to be able to grow it. But it, it will grow here and it grows pretty well. Do you know any place to get turmeric plants is another question. Uh, I have several varieties of turmeric. I've been growing it for over 10 years. It puts out a beautiful flower the second year. And uh, basically what I've been doing uh, is you can go online and get it or you can go to a health food store to start out. All you need is one little uh, root and it'll <laughs> multiply from that. Uh, there was a gentleman that used to go to the uh, Sarasota uh, market that used to sell various gingers and turmeric is one of them. Mm -hmm. And I, I got maybe four or five different varieties from him. 
So we can come to your house, John, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> can you suggest a good combination for a three foot plastic plant box? How about a little um, mint? Um, the uh, tarragon is a wonderful um, option. Um, oregano, another one really, really successful, kind of in four places. You may want a chive um, or two in there. That always works out pretty well. Um, so again, just um, give it a try. If, if they do well, um, that works. And then if you need to add to it, uh, you can do that as well. But I think what you'll be surprised about if it can be in a, a place that it's thriving, um, they will grow really, really fast. Uh, so you don't have to add to it that much um, at all. John, any, Kathy? I would say- Basically what, what I tell folks is if you're gonna plant herbs for culinary use, make sure you're planting the ones that you actually use. And easy ones. Especially and as, Be as Becky mentioned before, consider ones that like similar water re requirements and light um, and group those together in your pot. Uh, maybe you have a pot that has the more green herbaceous herbs that like more water and little less sun, put those together and then the woodier, more Mediterranean type herbs you could group together um, because they are sun loving and uh, want less water. Yeah, I, I basically tell folks, if you're gonna grow mint, grow it separately. It <laughs> will take over and uh, crowd out everything else. Are worm castings or compost good for a general fertilizer? It certainly adds in nitrogen. Um, I use a vermi compost um, with some of my soil, but I use it as a mixture. Um, when I try to get, uh, and then I usually buy a soil mix from Southern Ag because it's kind of a sterile soil, or at least it uh, is a, a nice soil with a little vermi compost mixed in. So it, it can be um, you're very helpful too. But I think it's, it's wise to take into account the comment that John Dawson made that you don't want to over fertilize because you ideally would like to keep your herbs as a compact um, type of a plant that's going to be pretty helpful to you. And we have a comment that cinnamon basil could be a good alternative. I'm not sure what that was in reference to. Maybe it's for the little garden that you would make. Basil, I just find, is, is an annual, um, so you need to realize that. And again, some basils are easier to grow um, than others. I find the, um, the Thai basil is kind of a lesser, smaller leaf and has a beautiful um, flower uh, as well as seeds. Um, and then the sweet basil, I kind of grow by itself so that I can tend it and make sure that if it gets any of the funny looking leaves that I can quickly snip them off uh, and make sure and try to keep my basil as healthy as possible. If you're saving the seed from basil, make sure you're only planting one type of basil because <laughs> if you have several different types, they will actually uh, blend together and your uh, next year's crop may not taste the same as this year's. True. Can drip irrigation mitigate the possible contamination associated with overhead spray reclaimed water? Sure, you just wanna make sure that you control it um, so that you're not overwatering those that really like dry conditions. Um, and as John said, that you can shut it off when it's gonna be raining, uh, like supposedly we're gonna have in these next couple of days. Um, so again, uh, you try to get a feel for how well your plants are doing um, if you've got the drip irrigation, you may want to move your plants or, you know, if they're in the landscape, uh, if they're in pots, then you kind of have to arrange it so that, um, you know, a little bit of the drip gets into the, gets into the pots. I usually hand water uh, most of my herbs, and now that I'm not traveling in here all the time, uh, it works out pretty well. And do you have a suggestion for an easy herb for making sleepy time tea, since you said chamomile was difficult? Ah, Angela. Okay, maybe, yes, maybe I can answer that. <laughs> yes, I think you well, can. Well, if you, if you, for example, lemon balm, Becky talked about lemon balm. That's a very nice plant. And then um, just combine it with peppermint 
And if you can get some chamomile, put it in as well. So that's a good combination. And Angela usually has taught me that if you make chamomile tea, it takes a lot of flowers, a lot of the plant uh, to that's make a nice correct. tea. That's correct. Yeah, so if you start that's with correct. a chamomile tea bag and then add to it, that may be the other way to do it. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, but I will talk about that on the 19th. So super. I will talk about it that a little bit more. Good. Doing pretty well, Kathy? Oh, she's muted. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> <laughs> Our last question is what community garden are you associated with? I'm at the Manatee Square Community Garden, which is over with where the Florida um, Department of Health is. Uh, we are wedged in between the Health Department building and the Women, Infant, and Children building. We have about 25 plots uh, that are there. We just expanded the garden. Um, so in September, end of August, we'll start to, um, to re-get ready for our fall September. Uh, Mac Lessick, who is one of our extension service folks, uh, if you're interested, certainly um, either get in touch with me or get in touch with him. Uh, and once we see how many gardeners return, uh, then we'll know how many plots we may have we may have available. So it's a nice it's a nice community of gardeners. There's also okay. a meal garden in Bradenton um, that's available. That's part of Bradenton City. That that do us that get us pretty close. That's that's we're through with the questions. We had a comment. Excellent presentation. I am motivated to expand my herb garden. Thank you very much for this online presentation. Yay. Well, I would like to finish with letting you know I included a chive flower um, there. And, and again, my best experience with uh, enjoying the chive flowers, the, the blossoms, as well as the leaves, were in Cambodia last January. I love the pho uh, that they make uh, for breakfast. And all of a sudden, the, they, you always put herbs in them. And one of the herbs that they added were the um, chive blossoms and the chive flowers. Uh, so again, there's nothing more delicate, nothing better uh, than, than actually experiencing that too. So go have fun. Um, you can't go wrong. Uh, if you do make a mistake, it's easy to correct. We're here at the Extension Service, so don't hesitate to touch base with us because we like to see you successful as well. Thank you so much for joining us. Does that do us, Kathy? Oh, Kathy and um, Cindy will send information um, so you can have the resources and have a couple of our PDFs um, after this in, in the next week or two.